Hi there, and welcome to this talk. Today we'll be talking about why looking at non-games UX makes for better games UX. A little bit about me first. My name is Bernice. I'm a UX designer for Pixelberry Studios, where we make interactive narrative games on the phone. And the goal of this talk is really going to be about encouraging you to open up how you think about UX beyond the game space, if you don't already, and arguing how that's actually really beneficial to the work that we'll do back in our games. All right, let's get started. So first, why this talk? Well, this talk is really going to be about, like I said, encouraging and showing the benefits of looking at UX from different perspectives. Um, in my experience in games, I felt that there's this strong tendency for us to look solely in the game space when it comes to addre addressing UX. And we tend to do that a little too heavily. Um, so while yes, UX and non-games and games are treated quite differently, they're not so different where we shouldn't be looking to non-games more, especially when it comes to learning more about common human behavior. What this talk is not is I'm definitely not saying to stop look at games to figure out games UX. Um, again, it's just more to say, let's keep an open mind of how we experience the world and we'll find that through a lot of non-game inspirations. And we'll find that the observations that we make will tie back into our game work in more ways than we would initially think. Um, if we only look at a problem from one perspective, we won't really know what we could possibly be missing. And that's really what this will be about. So this talk will be structured into three topics. The first topic, I'll talk about how looking at non-games can improve the success of games UX. And the second part, I'll talk about how looking at non-games can actually help develop a unique voice for us as UX professionals. And the third topic, I'll talk about how looking at non-games is super important for staying sane and mentally healthy uh, within our industry. All right, so first topic how looking at non-games can improve game UX. So in this section, I'm going to talk about some fundamental UX principles and then give examples of how games tend to tackle it versus non-games. So in this slide, we'll take the concept of merit and credibility, aka how do we convey the value of a player to themselves and to others? So in games, we tend to do this in many different ways. Um, we could use an endorsement system where people collectively vote on who out of a group was the best. Uh, but more often than not, we tend to use a ranking system where the game determines your status based on how well you're doing numerically. Uh, numbers like win and loss percentages do the same. We also do it using game related items or basically the status of how cool are the things that we own. For instance, in Animal Crossing, if your island is super decked out, the people that visit your island are going to associate that awesomeness of that island with you. And similarly, if you have a rare mount, people who see you with that item are going to think you're as valuable as that super valuable item you possess. So in games, value is largely determined by the rules of the system, which makes sense because we are creating an isolated world for our players to interact with. So of course we also create the rules of what is considered valuable. So in non-games, well, it's not so different except for the fact that we don't really have a system that determines objective value. Well, because in real life, what is considered valuable can range quite diversely. What is true though, is that we do tend to find value based off of the majority. So for instance, stats and numbers like view counts, likes and dislikes, the higher the numbers of the positive metrics are, the more value we associate to that content. Similarly, uh, in social media, retweets and likes, general engagement does the same thing. The higher the engagement, the more popular, the more we perceive this content or even this person as more valuable or trustworthy. In fact, this tendency is so strong that even if you had two social media posts of the exact same content, you will still consider the one that has the higher amount of engagement probably as more valuable than the other posts, even if they're exactly the same. That's just how powerful of an effect the majority has on us, whether or not we like it or not. 
Ratings and reviews do exactly the same thing. Um, how do we make decisions on what to purchase when we're unsure? Well, we tend to look at the ratings. The higher and the more positive they are, the more trust we give to them. Testimonials are another example of this, right? And now this does become problematic in terms of the reviews might not actually reflect the quality of the uh, product, but this tendency, this psychological effect that it has on us, that is kind of indisputed. So for non-games, value is more subjective. Um, when we're not sure what is valuable, when we're not sure what to do, we do tend to follow the majority as if it is the right answer. So I think there are very interesting takeaways here that we can learn from non-games and take back into our games. Um, in games, we do use this tendency of merit in the majority for engaging in competition, um, leaderboards being an example of this. But if people are comparing for better or for worse, how can we utilize more of how non-games approach this social proof to show subjective values in our games? For instance, uh, to encourage positive player and community behavior, ethics for instance, or if a player doesn't know what to do in our game, how can we utilize the value we see in the majority for them to act good and have that goodness be associated with player value? Now in this slide we'll talk about memory and specifically we'll be talking about something called the peak end effect. Now the peak end effect is an effect that basically says we don't remember the holistic experience of our past. Instead, what we remember of our experiences are really just the highs, the lows, and the final moments of what happened. Um, this is also called the memory bias or the recency bias. So in games, we tend to highlight the highs with a lot of affirmations. We tend to like to call out bonuses, chains, triple kills, etc. to make the player feel like they're doing a great job. When the system reminds us that we're doing good, we feel good. These are the highs. Lows also affect our experience. That's why having a terrible bug or a glitch can totally prevent a player from ever revisiting our game again. That's how crushing a low can be, and it's our job as UX people to help mitigate the unintended moments. And we also tend to judge our experiences based on the final moments we go through. The journey may have been amazing holistically, but unfortunately a bad ending can ruin the entire experience. Um, that's also kind of the problem with reviews and ratings. A lot of reviews are colored not by the actual quality of the full play experience, but by the moments we feel most strongly, the moments we most remember. So a game that might have been more consistent in quality, but had a poor ending, could get worse reviews than a game that wasn't so consistently great, but had higher highs or a more positive end. That's the same reason why games that have a more difficult ending will be seen as more difficult. So in games, we do a really good job with high peaks and delighters. We are really good at delivering kind of small moments of joy where we can surprise our players in a good way. So in non-games, the focus on memory is less about the peaks and more about kind of ending on a high note. For example, have you ever had a really bad start to going to a restaurant? Let's say you're out to dinner and you need to wait 30 minutes to get a table. And then they tell you, oh, you need another 20 minutes in order to order your food. So if you're anything like me, you're mad, you're probably a little annoyed, but then the food comes. And at the end of the meal, maybe your waiter offers you a free dessert or takes something off your bill. And suddenly you feel like your night was pretty decent because it ended nicely. Even if in actuality, you spent most of that time being angry. Amazon ghost stores kind of do the same thing. The end of their checkout process is that you don't have to wait in long lines and you can actually exit freely. And this easiness of how the shopping experience ends makes you remember it more fondly. Same thing with kind of rating app pop-ups. They say the best time to pop in these things is right after you complete something successful on the app. 
And that's because it takes advantage of having you remember the experience positively because something good just happened to you. And again, that's why reviews aren't always super honest or accurate to the quality of the product too. Uber Eats has this really delightful animation screen at the end when you finish ordering a delivery. Um, it celebrates what you've done at a natural endpoint of the ordering food flow, and it helps with making a nice lasting impression. So all in all, non-games have really good examples of how ending on a high note impacts memory. And I'm not saying that they don't focus on the peaks either, but if you think about how you remember your vacations or even conversations with people, I'm sure a lot of those feelings come from how those experiences ended. And I think there's a lot of takeaways um, we can learn from that. You know, Don Norman is quoted to have said, we should design for memory, not for actual experience. So if we look to the games field, how can we sequence difficulty and challenges, not just for the experience, but also for memory? Is it worth asking yourselves questions like, should we be designing for a less, maybe consistent stretch that has more peaks? or a better holistic experience with less peaks and what effect that might have. Now, the last thing we're gonna talk about here for this topic is recognition over recall. And it's basically all about reducing cognitive load. Um, this principle is just saying that it's easier for players to recognize than to recall information. It's easier if we have mnemonic cues to help us trigger our memory than needing to fetch the entire memory uh, by ourselves, so to speak. So in games, a lot of this revolves around usability with controls. It involves a lot about teaching the player how to play our game, how people are expected to remember all this information. And in this example, it demonstrates kind of a poor way of doing that because if we just give them a text box of instructions, it's kind of like rote memorization and that's really hard to recall if it's not done meaningfully. These two other examples are good examples of using recognition where you can see the controls are always on the screen. So the player is reminded of what buttons they need to press in order to do the proper action. Color context is also an example of using a uh, neomomic cue for recognition. Um, using colors that have already understandable associated meanings so that players understand what they do is an example of this, as in Dynasty Warriors in the West, green is used for health and for allies, and red is used commonly for enemies or for damage. So in games, recognition is really used for players to learn how to interact with the system. Now in non-games, there's a lot of interesting examples of recognition as well most popular one or most evident one being multiple choice. If we take in tests, we all know that it's easier to take a multiple choice test than it is to take a fill in the blanks test because for multiple choice, we just need to recognize if our options are right or not. We don't have to recall the answer from nothing. Features like recently viewed or histories also help us remember what we're looking at last time. This is another uh, mnemonic recognition cue. Things like autofill or autocomplete or predictive test, predictive text, excuse me, helps also give us context on what we might be looking for as we're looking for it. And music. Um, have you ever experienced um, thinking about a song but you can't really recall the lyrics, but when the song plays, it's as if you know those lyrics instantly? Um, this is the similar effect that happens. Uh, when the music is playing, that's kind of a recognition cue as opposed to when you don't have the music and you don't have any cues to remember the lyrics. It's kind of like when you know the face of a person but not the name. So in non-games, recognition is interestingly enough used to learn about the users. And I think that's a very interesting takeaway that we could apply to our games. Uh, for instance, you know, non-game tech is getting more and more recognition. It is getting easier and easier through predictive text to perform actions. So if we apply this back to our games, 
How can our games provide more cues to help players remember what actions to take? How could we use even predictive systems to help our players do what they want without them even realizing it? Of course, you know, in a good way. So to close out this first topic, if there's nothing else you take away from this talk, we'll just take away this one statement that game UX is everywhere, especially beyond the scope of our games. How we interact with the world isn't isolated to just how players play our games or how we play our games. Take the principles that you observe when you go out at a restaurant and think about how it could be translated into our games, because I assure you that there is something applicable between how you browse through your closet and how we can improve the experience of our games. But also, remember to be ethical. With great power comes great responsibility, and we all have a responsibility to use our UX influences for good. So, on to the second topic. How looking at non-games can help define your unique UX voice. So in this section, I'll talk about how kind of following that trail of finding UX in non-games not only helps you gain a better understanding of design, but also offers a niche where you could find yourself really enjoying that aspect of UX, and by doing so, define your own unique voice. So to start off, let's ask, what is UX? Well, I think this question uh, warrants a talk on its own, but UX encompasses many different fields. I often like to describe it as five jobs in one. So for newer people, it can feel very overwhelming to figure out what aspects of UX you should focus on or what your best strengths or interests are at. I know I felt like that and I still do sometimes. Here, I'm going to encourage that everything you do can help you answer those questions, especially if you look into the non-games related experiences. And looking at those experiences will help you figure out what makes you unique within the realm of UX from other similar professionals. So as an example, I want to share how my background in non-games actually helped me find UX back in college when I didn't even know that working in games or being a designer were actual jobs that existed. So back in college, I didn't know a lot, but I did know that I loved English. I loved the classics. I majored in it. I loved being able to craft a story and piece together the right combo of words and phrases so it had the most impact as I wanted it to. I also really enjoyed teaching. I found that really rewarding. This picture is of me teaching a one unit class on the trading card game Magic the Gathering to students. And um, Magic the Gathering is actually quite a complicated game. And I found that I really liked the challenge of introducing it to people in a way where new players could start understanding it. Um, and that could translate in making slides and doing demos and building a curriculum where there was always a clear purpose in what I was trying to do and how I wanted to introduce this game to people. And the other thing I really enjoyed was computer science. I dabbled in this for a couple of years and I loved it. I am no good at this, <laughs> but what I found most wonderful was the programming mindset. Uh, it really is all about problem solving and um, it really teaches you how to think just fundamental logic and it taught me to have grit and the trials and errors of attacking a problem until you, a solution is figured out. So really, all in all, I look back and I realize that I really like information architecture and hierarchy. I really enjoy the process of taking complex information and simplifying it and breaking it down or kind of manipulating it to kind of match what I wanted. And because of the experiences back then, it's helped me realize now that these are the areas where I love to shine in UX. And honestly, I take lessons that I've learned from each one of these fields back in college and I use them in my day to day work. So in these next couple of slides, I'm just going to show some examples of non-game inspirations that you probably see in your everyday lives that can spark inspiration of a particular aspect of UX. Um, and in this slide, we'll talk about visual influences. 
So the first field that may be very evident in being influential for the visuals is the field of architecture. A lot of the fundamental principles of graphic and visual design originated from the field of architecture. The whole principle of form follows function came from here. Uh, the Guggenheim Museum is a prime example of this. It's a whole structure that says design is not decoration and how all of the design promotes the utility of the product, right? The spiral inside makes it so that as you walk through the museum, you can see the art from wherever you're at. Similarly, uh, we can see how the environment impacts how we solve problems. There's something called the cathedral effect where it's uh, about the relationship that people have with space, uh, in this case of high to low ceilings. Uh, it says that people tend to feel more creative with high ceiling or open areas, and people tend to feel more focused or detail oriented when they are in low ceilings or more confined areas. And this has a very similar re relationship to uh, digital space as well, right? With compacted or spacious, spacious grouped icons. And this actually translates to perspective as well. There's a very similar effect of worm's eye view, where if, when you're looking up, it's very similar to the feeling you get with high ceilings. And the opposite is true, where bird's eye looking down is similar to the feeling you get with low ceilings. Another field of great inspiration for visual principles is, of course, photography or even cinema. Right here is just exemplifying the rule of thirds, which is just saying where the most interesting composition lies between those lines um, that you can see there, the vertical lines. And um, this is very applicable for when you're using marketing material or the layout of a web page, right? Their composition tends to look most interesting when the objects are placed at the intersections of those lines. So basically you'll find a lot of related if not the same takeaways from these other fields that you may not directly interact with in your game work or even think of and you can translate all of these principles back into our games um, or just in your knowledge of visual language to better understand it we can also draw really good examples and inspirations of accessibility and ergonomic principles from physical products as well one of those principles is to design for neutral postures. Now, when it comes to physical products like chairs, having a neutral posture is about proper posture maintenance and body alignment. But for our games, it's the same principle as designing for physical comfort or even the speed of motion so we don't have to put our players in an awkward position for too long. Another principle of ergonomics is minimizing fatigue and static load, meaning reducing the physical effort it takes to hold a position for a long time. Tools with fitted handles like this one try to prevent this and make it easier to hold. We should do the same with the games we make so that we don't get into a situation where our games end up needing to purchase an extra accessory to play because the controls are just physically too painful. Another principle is providing clearance, like providing for knee space for a tall person in an airplane. This is just like making sure a user interacts with our products without bumping into anything, really making sure that the elements in our game, like our UI, don't bump into each other and there's enough space between them, making sure that the space we have is used smartly. I think something that would be really interesting to tackle in games uh, that physical products do would be how could we design for more physical movement in our bodies to be healthier, like promoting stretch breaks when playing our games. I'd personally be really excited to see something like that in the future, but who knows. So to close out this section. You'll find UX in everything you do. You can draw so many UX inspirations from all around you everywhere. Keep an open mind and gravitate towards the areas you find interesting, especially if they're not game related, because you'll see that you'll gain a deeper understanding of why certain things work and why they don't. And your unique background will make you stand out amongst other people. And please, don't master them all. 
don't master all of the aspects of UX that you feel like you need to because I don't think anyone on this earth is able to do that. Just pull to what you enjoy and your strengths and voice will follow. Let non-games inspire you so that you have that breath to figure out what you do enjoy. So, on to our last and final topic, how looking to non-games is essential for creativity and good mental health in games. So if you're still not convinced over the benefits that looking at non-games have on your games, let me share with you some fun examples of unlikely inspirations that have helped make the games we know and love today. So first example, this is the Fushimi Inari Taisha. Sorry if I butchered that name. This is a shrine in Japan dedicated to Inari, who is a fox god spirit. And foxes are super important in this shrine. This inspired the series Star Fox. Uh, the creator of Star Fox was inspired by the foxes and by the arches of the shrine and it influenced even the gameplay of having players go through the rings like you would go through one of the gates or arches of the shrine. Pizza and uh, this is the Japanese character for mouth, Kuchi. Um, you may have guessed it too, but this resembles Pac-Man, the shape of Pac-Man quite a lot. The creator of Pac-Man was inspired, they say, by taking a slice out of a full pizza, and he was also making an eating game anyway, and since the eating character in Japanese is square shape, he wanted to round it out, making it into the circular shape that we know Pac-Man to be today. War of the Worlds and Star Wars. These all inspired Space Invaders. The creator of Space Invaders at the time was took a lot of influence from all of the space theme related content like Star Wars that were coming out back then. And he wanted to make a space themed game. And after seeing HG Wells' War of the Worlds, he always imagined having aliens looked like how they were depicted in the book and in the film. And he modeled the aliens after them which turned out better than making the enemies into people because fighting down squid-like creatures felt better than fighting down real humans. Another reason why stepping away from games and looking to non-games is so important is so that we can all help recover from burnout or unresolved stress at work. Um, it does a couple of things. It, it first refocuses our energy, right? Doing the same thing over and over again, our brain will get tired of it. Why not give it a break and let it rest? It's the same reason why we have weekends to recharge. It also helps improve productivity. It's the same as why getting sleep is so important. Our brain will just do worse if we don't give it a break. Similarly, um, resting can reset the mood and recharge us so that we're back into it. It'll help with work-life balance. Work-life balance is so important so that we don't lose our sense of self. If we focus all our energy into our career, we can leave room for the possibility of losing ourselves in it. And we can ask ourselves what we find important in life. You know, I ask myself, am I really going to remember that feature I needed to ship 10 years later? Or are we, am I going to remember the moments I've had with the people that I really care about? And of course, inspire more creativity. Research shows that being exposed to new and different experiences actually boosts our creativity. Uh, that's why being idle and daydreaming or relaxing are really the moments that where we have creative breakthroughs. Have you ever solved a problem just by going on a walk? Well, stepping back from our work and from just games will help us do exactly that. And here are some things I like to do that are not really game related that help me recharge. So all in all, non-games, non-game hobbies are good. And if we use how we interact with all of our world as inspiration for our games, think about how we could push the industry forward. Think about what new standards we could set for our players and all the new and unique stories we could tell, inspired by all the aspects in non-games, games, and in UX that makes you uniquely you. Thank you so much and have a good rest of the summit.